We're now live to YouTube. We're live to Shaw shortly. going live to Shaw. So I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to our meeting uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Thank our media and broadcasting partners for reporting on our meeting, broadcasting it. A Councillor Gardy made a, a good suggestion, which I am going to uh, follow up on. He, he thought it would be good just to uh, give the community a bit of a sense on how we're doing on vaccination. So I took a look today and I, uh, the most recent data I could find on APH's website indicated that 76.8% of our eligible population have received at least one dose, and 26.8% of our eligible population have received two doses. So we're making a lot of really good progress on our vaccination. I want to take the opportunity to do two things. The first thing I want to do is encourage the people in the community that have not been vaccinated uh, to consider being vaccinated and to uh, make the arrangements to be vaccinated. If you have concerns about being vaccinated, I welcome you and encourage you to speak to your uh, medical professionals about that. And I'd also encourage people who have received their first dose, uh, if they qualify for and can receive their second dose to make that arrangement. We've done really well as a community throughout this pandemic. And one of the reasons I believe that we've done well is a lot of people have uh, considered what they could do to keep their family and friends and loved ones in our community at large safe. And I want to thank you for that. I, I looked today and I think we have two active cases in the entire Algoma region. And that's really quite exceptional. Uh, but it's not an indication that we are out of this or through this or beyond it. It's not an indication that we could uh, just change our behaviors back to the way they used to be. I think what it is is an indication that listening to public health advice works. Listening to public health advice and following public health advice is important. I'd encourage everybody in the community to continue to do that. I'd also encourage everybody in the community who is not yet vaccinated to, con to consider being vaccinated. Uh, so thank you, Councillor Gary, for that suggestion and congratulations to the community uh, for doing you know, really well, I think, throughout. And uh, we we're all seeing signs of, of some life returning to normal and, and that's a positive and let's keep it there and let's keep it there by continuing to act responsibly and safely and, and caring for each other's health and well-being. Before we begin I just want to uh, take the opportunity to again acknowledge and recognize uh, that uh, we are in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe. Uh, this is Robinson and Huron Treaty Territory, home of Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and the historic Sault Ste. Marie Métis Council. I want to recognize our urban indigenous population. I also want to recognize that we're the head office of the Missinabe Cree First Nation. Uh, this area is historically known as Bauting, 
We thank all of our indigenous <coughs> neighbors and, and uh, indigenous communities for sharing this area with us. Madam Clerk, if you could uh, please start the meeting. Under agenda item one, I've got a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Scott, resolved that the minutes of regular council meeting of June 14, 2021 be approved. All in favor? Motion is carried. And under agenda item three, declaration of pecuniary interest, Councillor Christian uh, has declared with respect to the Algoma District School Board agreement renewal for the former Etienne Brule School site and the associated bylaw as he is employed by the Algoma District School Board. Okay, any other uh, declarations, Council? Seeing none. And under agenda item four, Got a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy resolved that the agenda for June 28, 2021 City Council meeting as presented be approved. All in favor? Motion carried. Under proclamations, agenda item 5.1, the PUC group of companies report to shareholder 2020. And Jim Bonifero, chair, and Rob Brewer, president and CEO of PUC, are in attendance and have a presentation. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I want to recognize uh, both Mr. Bonifero and Mr. Brewer. I want to welcome you to council and uh, thank you uh, for your good work this year. Uh, Jim, to you and the board, we appreciate the good governance of the PUC group of companies and the progress that we've made over the last year. And Rob, to you and the executive management team and the entire staff at the PUC. Uh, for your good work this year and, uh, and adjusting to the pandemic conditions, but also making sure we're doing what we need to do to uh, deliver uh, reliable power and good clean drinking water to our community and also uh, maximize the value of, of, of the PUC group of companies so that we can deliver value to our community. I want to thank you in advance for all the work we're doing in that respect. And uh, Mr. Bonfaro, I will give you the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here today uh, representing the board and um, would like to, to extend a thank you and recognition to three groups. First and foremost to you, the shareholder, Mr. Mayor, to you and council for the confidence and trust that you placed in the board for a number of years now, I think uh, year after year, and this year is certainly uh, a, an extension of that. It, 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 we're showing the successes and the uh, results of some good hard work and some good strategic planning. To the board itself, I think the board um, that, that's active today and has been active in the past, over the last three or four years especially, uh, set the tone and the vision for the organization. Um, well before the pandemic, by the way, I think with vision, our visions are, our vision values are um, safety, integrity, customer centric, innovative and accountable. And, and I, those served us well through the pandemic and will serve us well moving forward. The vision that the board has set um, was adapted well by staff. And that's the final group I'd like to say thank you to is staff. They've adapted well to a new governance model, a change in culture for some, um, and, and a, a vision that says we're much more than a company that provides electrical power to your house and water to your tap. We're more in the community and Rob is gonna, and justifiably so, this is staff's uh, time to share the successes with you and our shareholders report back to you, as well as the sustainability report. Both will be on our website and I encourage the entire community to go and look at that after, after this presentation. But to staff for the hard work, adapting during a pandemic, uh, we are very customer centric now and will become more and more. We will grow the business so uh, hats off to all three uh, groups. And with that, I'll, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pass it on to Rob and to staff to uh, share some of the successes and to look forward to uh, some of the future endeavors that we have on the plate. Thank you very much, Jim. Rob? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Council, for the opportunity to present uh, to you today. Uh, 2020 was a challenging year for all of us. Uh, but it was also an opportunity for us to look at things in a different way. And at PUC, one of the things that last year confirmed for us is that we're very fortunate to have the staff that we do. They had to adapt, they had to be creative, and they did it without complaint. Maintaining critical community services was crucial to our customers and our staff were up to the challenge. Next slide, please. 
In late 2019, as Jim mentioned, we refreshed our strategic plan, our mission and our vision and our core values. That exercise served us well through the last couple of years. Our core values are safety, integrity, customer centric, innovative and accountable. We have them proudly displayed in our building on our main floor, as you can see on the slide, and they are a part of all that we do. Over the course of this presentation, we'll highlight how we've lived up to those core values in 2020. Next slide, please. We're proud to say that not a single PUC employee had a lost time injury in 2020. And in fact, we haven't had a lost time injury in over two years. Recently, we celebrated a million man hours, or person hours, my apologies, working in challenging weather in high risk environments, all without a lost time injury. Safety, it's one of our core values. It's in everything we do from start to finish. Next slide. PUC was proud to be recognized in 2020 by the Electrical Safety Authority for its efforts to keep its employees and the community safe during the pandemic with the Worker Safety Award. Next slide. When masks were in short supply here in Sault Ste. Marie or in Ontario, and in fact, in all of Canada, our employees stepped up. They volunteered to make cloth face masks for colleagues. Uh, and we ended up donating a number to the public um, throughout the start of the pandemic. Family members of staff contributed as well. And you can see on the photos here, um, that there was both employees uh, and their families that worked diligently to make those masks. Next slide, please. Second core value of integrity. And since shortly after the pandemic started, our staff have filled out a daily assessment form. That, storm, or that uh, form was created as part of our employee app. It's an app that we developed at uh, start of uh, 2020, which we call the Hive. And staff can access that on smartphones, on tablets, or on computers. We're proud to report that none of our employees tested positive for COVID-19 in 2020 or 2021. Next slide, please. Our third core value of customer centric, which Jim highlighted, uh, PUC was fortunate enough to win the EDA Customer Service Excellent Award in 2020. We were commended for our efforts in delivering the province's affordability fund, demonstrating leadership in customer service, customer engagement, and in energy conservation. Next slide, please. And as we've reported to council previously, PUC led the province in delivering the AFT program. We were proud to be able to help our customers with new appliances, new heat pumps, and new methods of saving energy. As a community partner, this was central to our company's mission. Next slide, please. Our customer-centric philosophy is all about making the customer experience with PUC as easy as possible. Throughout the pandemic, we have provided customer supports with interest relief, payment plans, and a moratorium that was disconnected or that was uh, extended on disconnections. We've targeted donations to those most in need and we volunteered where possible. Next slide. At the start of the pandemic, PUC donated excess N95 masks and other PPE that we had to the hospital. We helped organizations in need with financial or volunteer resources, and we were very proud to help to light up the downtown with assistance from our line crews and with our staff decorating one of the downtown alleys. Next slide, please. In terms of education and partnerships in 2020, we had a number of pre-pandemic events that you can see above. These included the Caution and Chance School Program where we have staff going in and helping uh, grades four and five students better understand the hazards involved in dealing with electricity. We conducted electrical awareness sessions. You can see a photo there from the fire department. There have been seven contractor and organizations that have been oriented to date. Been involvement with the Chamber of Commerce, and you can see a picture of the slide there of our female senior leaders at the Women in Breakfast, Women in Business Breakfast. And then there was the emergency preparedness event, which was timely, 
with nine community partners, that being the Red Cross, City of Sault Ste. Marie, APH, Fire Services, et cetera. Next slide, please. Fourth core value, being innovative. Being innovative for PUC means being, there's a, a number of game changer initiatives underway, but it's being a game changer really for our rate payers and our community. And in 2020, we tested out spray and place pipe project. The SIPP lining technology provides a clean and safe polymer lined pipe interior in a safe and cost effective way. This new process significantly cut down on how long it takes to replace a pipe. It also provides a business opportunity for PUC moving forward and will lower the infrastructure renewal cost for PUC commission going forward. Next slide. Over the past couple of years, customer engagement events have consistently indicated that the way in which customers want to access their utility information is changing. So fewer people are choosing to physically come to offices or to call people on a phone. Web or app-driven services are becoming the dominant choice and PUC has listened. In the first half of July, PUC will be releasing our new customer app, the My PUC app and it will be available on both the Apple and Google platforms. Next slide, please. The MyPUC app provides access to consumption, real-time pricing, outage communication, and numerous other functions customers have asked for. Our goal is to provide our customers with access to information the way they want it. And we've heard loud and clear that easy to use apps are a big part of that. There will be an advertising campaign associated with the app launch, and we encourage everyone to download and use the app. Next slide, please. Our final core value is being accountable. 2020 was a solid year financially for PUC. There were certainly some headwinds, and I think we all saw those, but through managing costs, PUC was able to have a successful financial year. Next slide, please. For PUC Inc, income from subsidiaries was down slightly, but still considerably stronger than 2018 and prior. PUC distribution had a strong financial year with income similar to 2019 and capital expenditures up about 10% from 2019. We felt it was important to keep our capital expenditures as planned to ensure that there was work for local contractors when pandem pandemic conditions permitted. Next slide, please. For PUC services, AFT deliveries were postponed but are being completed now. So we'll see that catch up in 2021. And PUC commission revenues were up, costs were down, which increased the surplus available for capital improvements, which increased to 7.7 .7 million. Overall, the financial results were driven by managing costs and they remain solid in a very challenging environment. Next slide, please. 2020 started off with an ice storm. Seems like a very long time ago. Uh, PUC staff worked extremely long hours and partnered with other local resources to get our services restored. In later 2020 and in 2021, we targeted some of the vegetation and problem areas to provide additional resilience to future storm events. And we're continuing to do that later in 2021 and it'll be ongoing in 2022. Next slide, please. As the operators of the West End wastewater plant, our staff have been working diligently to ensure that as that plant is being upgraded, the plant continues to operate safely and reliably. Staff also managed through a significant event at GrowCap pumping station where we had both a transformer and a generator failure. And they were able to get the water supply restored quickly and without any interruption happening to our customers. Next slide, please. A major upgrade in 20 and 20, uh, 2020 and 2021 is our Zone 2 booster station project. We thank our partners, including our local firm here, s and for all of their safe work and diligence through the, uh, pen, the challenging pandemic environment. Next slide, please. And as you're aware, PUC has two electric vehicles. It's the first of many, and it's a start of a transformation of our fleet that will occur over the coming years. 
we will lead the transformation here in Sault Ste. Marie to a green vehicle future. We've taken the same approach with our paperless initiatives and our goal is to be paperless in five years and we're well on our way. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions council might have. Thank you for your presentation, Rob. Once this screen share is reduced, I can see everybody. Okay, so uh, we have questions, uh, opportunity to ask Rob questions here, Council. Councilor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, Rob and Jim, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and the preamble. And I think it's obvious based on, on the presentation, um, comments made by Jim Bonifero and and the mayor himself, that the PUC, you know, they don't see themselves, nor do they act like a regulated uh, company anymore. And I think that's really, really important. And I've had the fortune of, of witnessing, at least for a time, that transformation firsthand. Um, the PUC is quickly becoming uh, a dynamic organization and a real strategic partner for the city. So, um, I thank both gentlemen and PUC staff for the work that they're doing and the transformation uh, they're facilitating. Uh, my question, Rob, to you uh, has to do with the spray in place pipe um, initiative. This was something that I was really interested in when it was first brought to the PUC. Um, I'm glad to hear it was successful. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on where we're at with uh, future expenditures in this area, uh, system rollout, anything like that, anything like that, anything additionally you can add to that, uh, that point. Thanks for the question. Uh, the 2021 program is moving ahead as expected. Um, 2021 will be training, uh, some of the key components and key individuals that we have uh, that we'll need for future years as we transition from using um, a partnership we have um, into doing all of our own work with respect to that. We'll also be ordering equipment uh, and then you'll see a much larger program in 2022 and beyond. Um, we have a number of other municipalities that we'll be working with this year and significantly more than that in future years as well. Um, one of the real things that is key for us is, you know, we, we have a significant um, infrastructure hurdle uh, that we have within the uh, water side of the business as a lot of our infrastructure is coming of age and needs to be replaced. And, and this is an option for us that provides less impact to customers. It's, it's return to service generally same day. Whereas, you know, when we do traditional lining or open cut, I mean, it takes up to months in order to, to do something similar. It's also less costly. And so it allows us to, you know, lower the financial impact uh, to our customers. And, uh, you know, by lessening the, the physical impact and lowering the financial impact, it's a, it, it really is a game changer for us. Thanks. Uh, do, you, do you know at this point roughly what the cost savings are from doing traditional um, reconstruction of main, uh, main water lines? Is, is I can, there? I, yeah, I can ballpark. Uh, yeah. Of course, it's things are dependent on specific site conditions and okay. certain things. But if, um, you know, if you look at the cost of doing SIPP, it's roughly a third of doing an open cut on our own. So we could get three kilometers done for every one kilometer that we'd have to do on our own. If we were doing work in conjunction with the city doing sewer infrastructure replacement, then it's roughly a half. In that case, it's about half the cost of that. And it's uh, significant savings from traditional lining as well. So, so it Thank really is a, um, uh, it's a really good option for us going forward. Thank you. One, one final question relating to that. This, the, the, Technology, the company that sponsors this or provided this, do you give any indication as to how long this, this relining will extend the life of a uh, water main? Yeah, it's the 30 to 50 year range. Um, so it's, it's significant. Uh, what it does for us, uh, Councillor Christian, is it takes potentially a chunk of that infrastructure hurdle that we have and defers it 
30 mm -hmm. to 50 years in the future when we don't have as much that's scheduled to be done. Right. So it helps us levelize uh, that ongoing infrastructure replacement work. Very good. Uh, yeah, my recollection was that we had water main uh, uh, ages of 60, 70, and 80 years under there. So any, any extension we can get would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, my other question, one of them relates to, in, in your report, it mentions a company by the name of 17 Trees. It says the PUC has 100 common shares at 50% equity. Uh, what is this company and, and who owns the other por portion of it? I, it just, it was news to me and I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. So, um... As of January 1st, there's actually three equal partners in that. Uh, that was the original plan. North Bay, Sudbury, and PUC partnered to um, solve one of the main significant challenges that we had. Um, we were having a, a lot of difficulty finding uh, qualified and safe contractors for doing some of our high-risk utility tree trimming work. And tree trimming represents one of the highest risk activities that utilities do. And so having different contractors year after year after year doing some of your higher, highest risk activities was a significant risk for us as an organization. And the availability of those contractors was it was even difficult to find them to do the work because there was a um, significant amount of uh, tree trimming work coming on the market from Hydro One. This went back to about 2019. And so the three utilities decided to partner to create a uh, contracting company that currently serves the three utilities, may serve other businesses going forward, but we're con concentrating on that. It works on a cost plus five model, so it's roughly at cost. So it's a very cost effective way to do it. And it's an innovative way to solve our, uh, our risk of doing that type of work uh, by ensuring that we have continuity of individuals. So we have the same individuals and the same uh, supervision year after year after year, knowing that they have proper training, proper uh, equipment, and uh, and that the work that's getting done is being done properly and safely. And so um, for us, it was a, a way of mitigating risk rather than looking at it necessarily as a profit center. Thank you. Uh, the wise. One, one final question. Um, in the KPMG and in your, your report, um, it, it, it shows that, you know, you're carrying debt with the city, um, at a relatively high interest rate. And I, I understand the obvious benefit to the city for that debt. Has PUC looked at alternative financing arrangements, uh, in light of that, or does it make sense from the PUC's perspective to continue with this long-term debt arrangement? So when the when the companies were set up the way they are, um, mm -hmm. there was an asset transfer from what was a municipal entity over into a private corporation, which was the PUC distribution company. And along with that came a note payable back to the city. Um, when that was set up, the rationale for the interest rate was the current prevailing rate at the time. Now, that interest coupon and that interest payment results in a pre-tax payment because interest is deductible in a private corporation and is not payable in the municipal corporation. So it results in a pre-tax uh, transfer to the city for that amount. So it definitely from a PL perspective on the PUC, it is a bit of a drag on profits, but when you look at it holistically, um, there's some benefit provided to the city. Uh, whether that balances out is something I think that between the board of PUC and the shareholder that they can work out in the on going forward into the future. Um, but there is a, a bit of a balance there. So it certainly isn't just a, a draw on PUC. Thank you for that answer, Rob. I just uh, I appreciate that. And, and I, again, I just want to say I appreciate the work that you're doing and to the board and the staff of PUC. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Bonfero or Mr. Brewer? Seeing none, uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. Uh, appreciate 
uh, the good work that's happened and look forward to continuing to participate in, participate in it over the remainder of this year and next. So thank you. Thank you. I'll read the uh, PUC shareholder resolution under uh, 7.8.1. Yep. <clears throat> a motion by Councillors Christian and Gardy resolved that City Council is now authorized to meet in open session as the sole shareholder of PUC Inc. and PUC Services Inc. And further be it resolved that City Council appoints Mayor Christian Provenzano as Council's proxy to vote on the resolutions of the shareholder of PUC Inc. and PUC Services Inc. All in favor? Motion is carried. I have a resolution of the shareholder of PUC Inc. Financial statements, be it resolved that the financial statements of PUC Inc., the corporation, the fiscal year ended on December 31, 2020, together with the report of the auditors thereon as placed under the undersigned are hereby approved. Appointment of auditors, be it resolved that the firm KPMG LLP Chartered Accountants is hereby appointed auditor of the corporation until the close of the next annual meeting of the shareholder or until their successors are duly appointed at a remuneration to be fixed by the directors, the directors being hereby authorized to fix such remuneration and reappointment of board members, be it resolved that the following board members whose terms are up for reappointment be approved for a three-year term, Jim Bonifero, President and CEO of Bonifero Millworks, Christian Provenzano, Mayor, City of Sault Ste. Marie, and Isla Watson, Vice President, People and Partnerships, Sioux Area Hospital. I vote in favor of that resolution. And I have a similar resolution for the shareholder of PUC Services, Inc. With respect to financial statements, be it resolved that the financial statements of PUC Services, Inc. for the fiscal year ended on December 31, 2020, together with the report of the auditors thereon as placed before the undersigned are hereby approved. Appointment of auditors, be it resolved that the firm of KPMG LLP Chartered Accountants is hereby appointed auditor of the corporation until the close of the next annual meeting of the shareholder or until their successors are duly appointed at a remuneration to be fixed by the directors, the directors being hereby authorized to fix such remuneration. And reappointment of board members, be it resolved that the following board members whose terms are up for reappointment be approved for a three-year term, Jim Bonifero, President and CEO of Bonifero Millworks, Christian Provenzano, Mayor, City of Sault Ste. Marie, Neil Strom, Mill Controller, Algoma Steel Inc., and Isla Watson, Vice President, People and Partnerships, Sioux Area Hospital. I vote in favor of that resolution. M Madam Clerk, the, 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 the resolution that I have in front of me for the PUC Inc. and not PUC Services, it has Neil's name on it also, but I didn't hear you say Neil's name. Uh, did we, did we, does that make a material difference? Both the resolution that of PUC Inc. and PUC Services Inc. have Neil Strong. But yes, I didn't you're correct. I read too fast. My apologies. Okay. So just to be clear, then I, we approve the resolution in both respects. That includes Neil, so he won't be left off the the one board. Okay, thanks. That's correct. Very good. That will take us to the consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jim. So, uh, Councillor Christian, you reached out to me and indicated you had some matters on consent. Uh, and then Councillor Vezuallen did the same. I see Councillor Shoemaker's hand, so we'll go in that order to begin with. Christian, Vezuallen, Shoemaker, and then Gardy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just, give me one sec here. I wanna bring up the resolution. 6.2, new optional small business tax. Uh, questions through you to, uh, I guess, Michelle or Mr. Ver. Um, first, first of all, I, I just want to say that I, I support the concept. I, I, I think any time that we could uh, take some control over so much Ontario legislation, if we can have some autonomy in an area like this, and perhaps if through this exercise, we could help uh, some local business, that would be a good thing. Uh, my question, though, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Michelle or to Mr. Ver, um, in the report, it says that the province has indicated they will provide matching reductions in the education tax rate on a case-by-case -case basis, and then it lists uh, two criteria underneath. When they refer to the case-by-case -case basis, 
Are they referring to individual businesses or are they referring to a municipality in general and the municipality must meet those two criteria listed underneath the statement? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Christian, um, we're not really sure in regards okay. to whether it's on an individual basis or by a municipality. And the key word there as well is not that they will provide. They may um, it, it does say that in the report, but they have the option of not doing that. But we want to make sure that if we do um, go forward with this uh, subclass, we want to make sure we're in the position that we um, can um, have that matching funding from the province. So we need to make sure if we do this, we need to have the bylaw as well. We need to conduct a consultation, which we are asking for um, in this report. Thank you. I, I recognize it's very, very early and, and obviously you're bringing it before council to see if you even move forward with this. But do you have any idea of how many businesses could potentially be impacted? You may not be able to answer that question yet, I recognize, but I'll ask it anyway. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Christian, it will really depend on how we determine what a small business is. It right. could be, as you saw in the report, it could be based on a, a class, whether it be restaurants, retail, offices, services, a physical address, like a geographic area, site characteristics. So depending on where we land with this, uh, we'll determine how many businesses will be impacted. What, thank you. What will help determine that? Will that be a, a consultative process or will that be something that perhaps staff within the city will, will determine? At this point, our, our plan is to look at various options and model it to see what the impacts will be. As you know, we also have to consider our local um, um, long-term tax policy through this. We have other implications within it. And whatever we do for this subclass will ultimately affect everybody else, whether it be through a levy, a levy change or whether it be that um, other people have to absorb it. So it's a real balance in how we do this. And that's why we want to have the consultation. So we'll have an option or maybe uh, various options that will be part of that consultation as we go through it. We're just in the development phase of this at this point. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the comments because as you say, there's, there's really no such thing as a free lunch if we're reducing tax, uh, taxes in one area, we're either gonna have to, as always, either reduce services or spread the, uh, the burden. So I appreciate the comments, but I do think it's something that we should look at. Any ideas uh, that are non-traditional when it comes to taxes are, are things that I'd be willing to consider for sure. So thank you. Okay, anybody else in 6-2? Nobody else in 6 oh, Councillor Bruni on 6-2? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to, to Michelle, so the consultation, who will you be consulting with? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bruni, again, we're still developing the consultation. So if Council approves our recommendation to move forward with this, I will be meeting with our economic development team and we'll be putting, putting a plan together. But we want to consult with small business. We want to consult with various stakeholders. We also want to consult with uh, the other stakeholders that aren't necessarily impacted with it. And one of the things that we want to do through our consultation is also to um, speak to what other assistance uh, the municipality can perhaps provide to other businesses. Thank you. Anybody else on 6 2? Councillor Christian, do you have any other matters? Yes, a couple more, Mr. Mayor. Um, six. Um, 6.5, a question through you to Mr. Peter Johnson, our fire chief. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you. Uh, I, I think this, again, this is another good, uh, good initiative. I know that uh, Councillor Shoemaker and I uh, brought this forward several months ago. I read over the report and, and, I'm, and I agree with having a third party do the cost recovery. I just, one simple question, I wasn't completely clear on how we came up with the estimate of 88,000 to 106,000 uh, in possible cost recovery. Maybe it's in the report. I, I saw numbers, but 
it didn't, I, I, it wasn't clear enough for me. I'm just I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Uh, through you, Mayor, through Councillor Christian, it's, it's Paul Milosevic here. I'm on behalf of Peter tonight. Okay. Uh, those numbers were generated from the uh, purchasing report by Miss uh, by Karen uh, Farrell. Okay. Or Marlo, I'm, pardon me. So those are the numbers that were came through her report. Our conservative estimate was in the range of thirty to 50000 Right. Uh, and that we felt was conservative. We, we felt there could be more comparators in the province, but uh, that's the number we used in the initial report last uh, November. Right. Okay, well, that, that's the only question I have on, on that item. I, I think the only comment is, I, I think it's a win-win. I think, uh, I think it's good for fire services in terms of um, trying to drive efficiencies because, uh, you know, it is time consuming when you're out on false alarms. And there's no real, uh, there's no real liability here if, uh, in terms of cost, because the only uh, method of payment for the third party is through cost recovery itself. So definitely a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in six five? Shoemaker. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, an important point. It's not a question, but a comment, uh, and, and perhaps. Uh, Paul uh, Milosevic can confirm this. I think an important point uh, here is that cost recovery will uh, generally not be from individuals themselves, but uh, insurance policies that'll cover things of this nature. So it will uh, it will more often than not be uh, some, something someone's already uh, got coverage for that will be paying uh, for these uh, recovered amounts. So it's uh, nothing out of the homeowner's pocket, and it's and it's money into the fire services pocket, so it's uh, it's a win-win in my opinion. And Mr. Milosevic, can you confirm that? Yes, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Councilor Shoemaker. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the the original report back in November had to do with some other cost recoveries on false alarms, things like that. Those are different than the what's on the agenda tonight, which is the fire mark report, which is a third-party report, and that all comes from. Uh, recoverables are within a homeowner's policy as it is now. So they don't they don't come out of the uh, homeowners, they, they don't pay extra. Those are items that are within their insurance policies that are recovered by Firemark. And we see 70% of that, whatever they recover. That's great, thank you. Anybody else in 6-5? Councilor Christian, your next item. Yep, last one, uh, six ten. Uh, through you to uh, Mr. Anderson, knowledge-based um, task force. Uh, I just I just want to start off by saying that I, I, I really appreciate this report. Uh, very, very timely. And, and I think it's an issue that we really need to get our heads around. Uh, the stats in the report uh, show a demographic shift and a need for recruitment and retention. And the one stat that stood out was the fact for every one, one available job uh, coming, uh, being available, uh, there are 1.5 people leaving the workforce. That's, that, that's a real staggering number, something that we should be concerned about. But on the flip side, one of the big problems with Sault Ste. Marie over the years is people left because there were no jobs. So clearly we're coming into a uh, time when jobs are available and that's why I support this initiative because we need to get the message out there that there are opportunities in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, my question uh, to Mr. Anderson is, will you be providing additional information on uh, the media initiatives, the specific uh, media initiatives uh, the mediums will use, the messaging that we're getting out. Uh, can we get updates on that? For you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Christian, um, absolutely. We will be uh, updating um, and Council uh, with a report that will include not only the, the uh, type of media buys that we're doing and the marketing that we're doing, as well as the images, but um, We'll also be including the metrics uh, that we've been using to track the success of these campaigns and uh, the, um, the final results of the campaigns themselves. So I anticipate to uh, be providing that to council at, at a later date. Um, 
As you're probably aware, we've got a number of campaigns going on right now. We recently concluded one with McLean's. Uh, most recently, we had one active with uh, Loeb and Nail, and we're looking to do more over the course of this year. Good. Um, and I know we've had initial talks about having a second Sioux Summit, which has been postponed, obviously, because of the pandemic. Uh, would it be possible uh, in some format or some way to reach out to those participants, uh, either now or for the next summit, if we can arrange it, uh, simply because these people are well connected in their uh, related industries and, and they could be a real asset at this point uh, to help support our, our media message and just the overall campaign. Could, could, can you comment on that? Yes, uh, that, uh, that's definitely something that we would be looking at and I'll uh, converse with uh, Mr. Bear to, to uh, discuss how we can best distribute some of that information. Um, one last point I will uh, highlight is that we did roll out the Adventure Pass June 1st. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the items that we are seeing is sig significant outreach uh, from new residents on that. Um, while we don't have the total number of new residents, we are seeing, I think, uh, a real strong shift in people relocating to the Sioux. Um, so that's been very positive. Yes, I, I agree. That's it's really good news. And, and I really appreciate the effort in this area. Uh, I, I think this is an issue that's flown under the radar somewhat. I, I don't know if the general public is aware of the situation in the Sioux. They often say there are no jobs. There's an opportunity or a situation presenting itself in the Sioux. And I think as council, we need to keep this front and center because uh, this can either be a long-term problem for us or a long-term solution for us. So I appreciate, again, the effort that you're putting into this. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councilor Shoemaker on 610. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Anderson. Um, Mr. Anderson, do we keep a uh, database or, or list of people who've got certain skills that are looking to move back so that we can pair them with, with opportunities as they arise? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Shoemaker. Um, we do in varying degrees. Um, obviously, we've had uh, substantial outreach through the RNIP program. Uh, we've been cataloging, um, you know, the, the individuals that have reached out to us with their various skills. We also run a program called the um, Spousal Recruitment uh, Program, which uh, pairs individuals that have relocated here. They may have spouses that uh, are unable to find employment immediately uh, that may have very valuable skill sets for the community. So we try to match those individuals with various employers across the, uh, the community. And, um, you know, in addition to RNIP and the spousal recruitment, we, we do get regular outreach from people uh, looking to relocate and our labor force coordinator um, does maintain that information. Okay, really that, yeah, that's, that's uh, where I was going with that. So if someone uh, is an expat or whatever the case might be and wants to move back to the Sioux, they can reach out to our labor force coordinator and, and, and kind of be kept track of to some degree. Absolutely. And uh, I would also recommend that they, uh, uh, you know, constantly take a look at the Welcome to SSM uh, website and the job board there. There's uh, quite a number of, um, you know, excellent uh, careers and uh, jobs available on that website. Okay, thanks. And uh, more, a bit more specific to this report, um, is our recruitment, uh, our marketing recruitment, broad based or does it uh, target uh, specific skill sets, specific uh, areas, specific industries? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, I would say that it's a combination of the two. We have uh, specific programs for uh, industries where we know there's a high demand, such as healthcare, IT and finance uh, and skilled trades. Uh, and then we are also marketing, um, you know, obviously there's been a significant shift in remote work uh, as a result of COVID and a number of other reasons. Um, so we are doing sort of a broader base marketing program around the quality of life and, uh, you know, benefits of, of Sault Ste. Marie. And we're seeing based on, uh, you know, we're trying to get some more data points here, but based on the outreach that we've had uh, recently through the Adventure Pass is we're seeing a good mix of both. I would say that, uh, you know, at least half of the individuals that are relocating here are relocating with remote work. And then uh, the remaining half are finding, um, you know, um, good quality positions uh, here in the Sioux. I, I 
you've, you've described uh, industries that we target, or, or I guess uh, uh, broad, broad industries we've targeted, we've targeted sorry. My uh, question was a bit more uh, specific, perhaps I'll ask it a bit more uh, bluntly. Have we targeted folks such as those who work at OLG that are working remotely that could easily do their job from Sault Ste. Marie? So when I talk about uh, specific industries. I mean, specific employers who it makes logical sense to have them here. At this point, um, you know, I know that there were some higher level conversations uh, that I wasn't personally involved in with respect to looking at some of the positions at OLG um, to Sault Ste. Marie, but I haven't had any of those specific conversations at this time. Okay, I do, I do think there's an opportunity there, and I, I think it would be worth exploring further uh, targeted measures for those employees. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hollingsworth on 610. Thank you. Uh, through you, your worship to Mr. Anderson. First of all, this is well done. Um, just um, expanding on to your welcome to Sault Ste. Marie. Um, how are you driving um, these new individuals to uh, your welcome to Sault Ste. Marie website? Um, the guy goes hand in hand. Um, it's a wonderful industry. People are coming because of your campaigns, but how are you actually driving them to know that we have all these other wonderful uh, activities and services? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, um, we have a number of tactics that we utilize. Uh, we have a pretty robust uh, social media platform uh, through Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn, where we uh, highlight jobs of the week or other, other items that... Uh, we're able to highlight about uh, quality of life. Uh, in addition, when we do our marketing, we often, uh, well, uh, at all times, we include links to uh, Welcome to St. Marie in the job board there. Um, you know, and so I think there's a fair amount of robust marketing that we're doing to drive uh, people to that website. Okay, two other questions. Um, have you started, have you considered partnering with one of our local media partners to devise a campaign to um, expand on your social media campaign and so forth? Uh, certainly, we've been, uh, we have uh, partnered in the past and we continue to partner with uh, some of our local providers that have uh, substantial uh, reach, not only in the community, but also uh, external to the community. And uh, with the full realization that those that are uh, most likely to relocate are those with uh, personal connections, whether it be uh, friends or family to the community. Okay, and one last question. Um, it's still going with welcoming the individuals because of the industry, the jobs and so forth. But um, I also understand the president of the real estate board has done two surveys with her um, agents to understand, are they coming because of your campaign? Are they coming because of the job market? Or are they moving here because of COVID? Are they brand new to our community with no ties to Sault Ste. Marie? or are they just moving back? And um, I know that I did submit uh, a suggestion to the agenda review committee, and I know they're still considering it to do a proper welcome uh, campaign. So I look forward to having you uh, speak maybe with uh, Tracy and um, possibly with others um, to make this more of an embracing welcome after um, we get through more COVID of course, but uh, good work and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hollingsworth. Uh, anybody else for Mr. Anderson on 610? Uh, Travis, before we let you go here, just want to thank you for the good work. It's nice to see us build upon Future Sault Ste. Marie. It's also nice to see that with the Future Sault Ste. Marie work, we, we actually got out ahead on a number of these things. And uh, we're frankly prepared to, to do these marketing campaigns to, you know, with a new brand. And, uh, you know, it, it, it demonstrates it in the work we did in RNIP and leading the country in that respect. So, Council should take a lot of pride and comfort in, in uh, what we did with you, Sault Ste. Marie, and how it set us up to continue to work to, to deliver on, as Councillor Christian frames it, some solutions uh, for our community. So thank you, Travis, for all your efforts in that respect. You've been instrumental to it, and I've appreciated your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so uh, that uh, is it for Councillor Christian. That brings me to Councillor Vezo Allen. Councillor Vezo Allen, you had, I think, 6.1. Correct. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to um, Mr. Lamming. Uh, Mr. Lamming, 
There we, there you go. Um, could you please um, give us a estimate of what has been spent so far during the EA process for the bus terminal? So consultants, um, advertising, survey taking, all, all of that in a nutshell, what's been spent to date? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bezo Allen, approximately $41,000 has been spent on the EA process and the items you have mentioned. Okay. And how long approximately has this process been ongoing for you and your team? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bezo Allen, it started last year and has now gone to uh, about a year, about a year into totality right now. Okay. Um, my only other question is, um, with the ICIP grant, the uh, Investing Canada Infrastructure Program, um, with those funding parameters, are you able to purchase or acquire either land or a capital asset within that funding? So what I'm asking is if we, um, you know, as some of, there's been allusions of looking at elsewhere other than what we already own, be it the Dennis Street Terminal or Huron Street, within that funding, are we able to purchase a building or land um, to establish a different location for the bus terminal? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bezo, um, through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, land is not an eligible expense uh, for funding. So it would have to come out of our, our budget. Um, the only other question regarding funding, was the funding approved for the Huron Street um, renovations through the ICIP? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bezal, and yes, that was uh, approved funding. Okay. No other questions on 6.1? Anybody else on 6.1? Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. White. Um, Malcolm, if... Uh, uh, council wishes to proceed with authorizing the uh, additional funds be spent for the <clears throat> uh, expansion of this EA process. Um, would this be uh, the appropriate time to put that forward or is there a, a, another possible date coming? Through you, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Shoemaker, I would uh, suggest that if that's going to be considered, it'd be considered at the next council meeting, July 12th when we will return the information that was requested last meeting uh, regarding uh, the, the cost and feasibility of a new build at the Dennis uh, Street site. Uh, if we do that, council will have uh, the totality of information to date before them to make a, a decision like that. And uh, <clears throat> I think it will be easier should council make a decision uh, like that, that uh, you council would be able to give us as much clarity as possible as to what they would like to see in an amended EA. Okay, thanks. And uh, uh, just for clarification, you had mentioned that at the next meeting, there'll be information back on uh, potential reconstruction of the uh, building at the existing site. Will there be information back at the next meeting on, on steps that would need to be taken if we were to look elsewhere or is that uh, like like the old ACR station as I suggested at the last meeting or is that what this report is intended to answer? Uh, certainly we, we this report and uh, we would be able to answer questions at the next meeting as to what that process would look like. Okay. Uh, so it's so it's the cost uh, the cost is laid out here. Yes, uh, you're saying that there'll be additional information that might be relevant before proceeding at the next meeting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Councilor Shoemaker, I think uh, for for your own comfort, we're accepting this as information. There's nothing that would prevent you at the next meeting from from moving a motion to adjusting the EA or increasing its scope. Perfect. Thank you, <clears throat> Councilor Miro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Question for Mr. Lamming. Uh, Mr. Lamming, is there any uh, are there any deadlines that we should be concerned about uh, when we're looking at these alternatives with the ICIP transit funding in relation to this project? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Nero, if we don't proceed in, within the next few months, we'd at least uh, touch base with ICIP to uh, give them an update on the project because it was approved for this year to move forward. So we would need to connect with them. But there's nothing in, you know, in the short term that would... Um, jeopardize this project in the, in the short short term no okay thank you thank you mr mayor 
Council Dufour. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just have a follow-up question for uh, Mr. Lamming. Uh, Mr. Lamming, in your answer to Councillor Vezo Allen about the cost so far in the EA process, um, was that in, that cost inclusive of the transit route optimization study from 2018 and its discussion of a terminal location? Through you, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Dufour, that cost uh, predated this, uh, this subject here. So that cost was only for the EA to date for the potential relocation. Okay, ha having read that section of the 2018 uh, consultants report, um, can, can you just speak a bit about how much um, time was spent at that time uh, examining uh, the whole issue of a downtown terminal? I, I know that in the report, uh, the consultant uh, in 2018 uh, stated clearly that downtown does need a terminal, but said it was flexible where the location was. Um, can, can you speak about any consultation or, or what went into that recommendation from that report? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Dufour, I've reviewed the report and obviously very familiar. It did predate my time here. Uh, it was a combination of public works and community services at the time. So maybe I'll defer the, the question over to the CAO uh, to provide some further information on that. Certainly. Go ahead, Mr. CEO. Councillor Dufour, could you just repeat that question, please? So, um, Mr. White, I'm just I'm going back uh, to the further of what I see is the first consultant's report that addressed the issue of a downtown terminal location, which was the transit use optimization study in 2018. Um, and I it had a couple recommendations about the need for a downtown terminal, but there being flexibility given the location of that terminal. Um, and it's been my understanding that that was the basis for staff's recommendation to move forward with 111 Huron. And I was just uh, looking for a little bit more context uh, or background about what went into that consultant's uh, recommendation in 2018. Um, <clears throat> through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dufour, I'm not sure I have a lot of granular detail for that. That was certainly prior to um, me being CAO. And uh, uh, I'd be happy to do a question for a discussion at the July yeah. 12th. Meeting. Certainly, I, I'll make sure you have some of that information uh, brought back uh, on July 12th. Okay, thank you very much. Council, anybody else in 6 1? Councilor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Um, through your worship to Mr. Vare. Um, Perhaps for the next meeting, July 12th, since we're going to get more to a discussion on that date, can you be prepared to summarize um, what you have done to educate the public more on the pros and cons of both locations? It's my understanding that you have started to reach out to um, a number of people. Um, so my question to you is, Will you uh, be coming back July 12th with further uh, information on how you've educated the public on this important decision? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, yes, that's something we can uh, provide to Council in the report on the 12th. Okay, um, because um, I think we're all still receiving a lot of emails and phone calls um, with regards to hypothetically, if the current location is no longer, uh, how is this going to impact the bus stops? How is this going to impact the washroom facilities and so forth? So um, I look forward to having more of this um, information on July 12th. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. Anybody else in 6-1? Okay, so Councilor Bezoel, and I think you said next you have 6-8? Correct, 6.8, the downtown safety plan. Go ahead. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, my only question is regarding the um, $104,000, that's an estimate for the ambassadors. So from what I've taken from the report, it's going to be something similar to the Guelph model where the ambassadors really are um, social workers. So is that sort of the same model that's being proposed? And is it more than one ambassador? Um, for that, that uh, budgeted amount. It's through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Vezo Allen. <clears throat> that model uh, and the number uh, came from our collaboration with uh, CMHA 
And so we would be looking at having um, two of the ambassadors together on a shift uh, that would be working in the downtown. Okay. And where would they, would they work out of a specific location or it would be something mobile similar to what we're seeing with the community wellness bus? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Vezo Allen, uh, the idea is the ambassadors would be um, uh, mobile in that they would be on patrol and, and walking around the downtown. Uh, it would be a collaboration uh, with the BIA and uh, the CMHA. And so um, likely they would, their home office, if you will, would uh, be out of the CMHA, uh, okay. but it would be a collaboration. Okay. And then just closing comment, I just want to, um, Kelly Walker from the DTA board, um, has been very active um, in this committee and meeting with uh, both Constable Kirkpatrick and Cochimilio. So I just want to acknowledge um, all the time and effort um, as well with you, Tom, that has gone into this. So thank you. I don't have anything else on 6-8. Okay, anybody else on 6-8? I do. I do. I do. Mr. Hollingsworth. Thank you. Um, through you, your worship, to Mr. Ver. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, we've been waiting for this report. Um, so thank you for um, the work you've done on this report. And I know that more um, work is being done. So also I want to say thank you um, to um, many community business leaders in the downtown area that have decided to locate, relocate from other areas of the community to the downtown area. And um, there's uh, more and more uh, corners that are being spruced up because of these business leaders. So I want to say thank you. My question to you, Mr. Ver, um, you mentioned that um, these ambassadors, and it's an excellent idea. I'm under the impression that you're still looking for some grant money. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, yes, that's correct. Uh, there are some funding programs that uh, we're investigating now and hope that they can contribute to the cost of this program. So to the cost of the ambassador program, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. And for the viewers at home, um, a number of us do enjoy the downtown area. I'm happy that the patio's open, happy to participate in the patios. Um, for the viewers at home, can you outline currently what are the current safety measures that are being taken um, in the downtown area? For example, I understand speaking to um, chief um, of police that um, the bike patrol is happening. Uh, can you just touch on some other safety um, measurements that are taking place? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, uh, you're correct. Uh, the police chief updated the, uh, the members of the BIA. I happened to be at that meeting uh, that night. And uh, there was talk of the, uh, the bike patrols that have started with the police. The police have also uh, in the past um, done increased spot patrols based on activity and looking at uh, crime analysis data. The uh, police have also um, offered their services to uh, work with the businesses in the downtown to look at uh, what they call SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design and how they can um, increase and improve security just based on you know, lighting and, and different aspects of the uh, storefronts. And um, as well, I know the, uh, the BIA has um, uh, taken up with security patrols on a, on a spot basis in the evening time uh, in the downtown as well. Okay. And um, in your report, you briefly touched about some surveillance cameras. Um, you mentioned that current business owners have uh, created or made or put up their own cameras. Um, can you comment on... Can, did you look into us as a city uh, potentially putting up cameras and or can you comment if we could work in conjunction with the police putting up some cameras throughout the downtown? Can you comment on that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, I would say we've had uh, preliminary discussions uh, with the uh, BIA and the police chief was in the meeting about different options related to surveillance. We have looked into some of the research on, um, uh, you know, the privacy implications and what other communities are doing uh, in Canada as it relates to uh, CCTV cameras. And uh, that's something that is uh, ongoing in the discussion. And when we come back to council, we have, hope to have more information there. Okay. Um, my last question and comment, um, again, this resolution that I passed or I I created back in 2017 is finally in front of us. So I'm glad it is. You mentioned that you're going to be coming back to us with more information. 
um, but there's no date. I didn't see any date in your report. Um, may I suggest that um, when you and I talked October be a deadline, is that possible? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, yes, uh, I believe by October we'll be able to return to Council and have the uh, recommendations and the proposed uh, contributions uh, to the safety measures uh, in front of Council at that time. Okay. Safety is, I know, Council's number one concern because um, it's our downtown, it's, it's our welcoming mat to our tourism, it's our, it's our, our fun area for our community. Long story short, we have a lot of wonderful projects that we're looking at the downtown plaza. Um, we just are talking about the new, potentially new transit hub um, and so forth. So safety, if we can just nail this down where our whole community is feeling more comfortable coming downtown, um, I think that should still be um, our number one concern. And then these other wonderful projects would then definitely be uh, more attractive. So again, Mr. Bear, thank you for your hard work on this. And um, we look forward to hearing more um, of safety. Thank you. Yeah. Got a bit of a list on this now, Councillor Shoemaker, and then Councillor Nero, then Councillor Dufour. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's only somewhat uh, connected to downtown safety, but um, the for, for probably four or five police chiefs now, the chiefs have been talking about the need for a new police services building. Uh, and uh, as a member of the board there, have you or the board had any discussions with respect to moving the police station downtown if a new one is ultimately built uh, sometime in the future? So, well, Councillor Schumacher, I, I, I can answer that. I think uh, Councillor Vezo Allen, who's also on the board, can offer anything that, from her perspective. Uh, I will point out that, that there is a presence uh, at the jump station, the station mall, so that the police services did make an effort to locate a presence downtown. With respect to a new police service building, you know, I can confirm that there, there seems to me to be a desire on the services part uh, to, uh, to move in that direction. And I think that there's support, certainly at the board level to consider what has to be done. Uh, I think the first part of the assessment is assessing whether the, the current building can be retrofitted to suit the needs. Uh, and, and if it can be retrofitted to suit the needs, what those costs are. And then you would compare those costs to what the cost for a new building is. I understand that Sudbury and Thunder Bay are going through the same process and, and they might be a little farther along and the, the costs for new buildings at Sudbury and Thunder Bay, I think are, have been significant. And I expect the same thing would be here in Sault Ste. Marie. But to answer your question pointedly, uh, have there been discussions about locating it downtown? There haven't been specific discussions about where a new police service building would be located because we're, we're not at that stage of the process. And I think that there would be obviously some significant interest on the police services part to make sure that the building was located in a, in a, in a really strategic location that could get, you know, access across the city effectively. Um, I, I can tell you that from my personal perspective, I would like to see if a new building is built on the police services, I would like to see that building built in the downtown. I would like to see all those employees brought into the downtown core. And I think, I think there's a lot of sense to, to uh, locate the building in the downtown. But that's just, that's my personal perspective. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, a perspective that will carry the day. And, and uh, I think that it would be a good thing if it's considered. I've, I've had conversations with the chief directly about whether or not uh, he thought the downtown would be a good location for the, build, for the, for the building if, if uh, the police service board does move in the direction of building a new building. Um, but, you know, those are discussions that, that have to be had in the future. And they have to be had after some assessment and some data, right? You know, we... we have to locate the building where it makes most sense, independent of any specific person's desire to locate the building in a specific place. So, so we're not there yet, uh, but that is that is a potential in the future, and that's a potential consideration for a new building if the police service board gets to that decision. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks. That that's helpful info. I would I would I guess uh, add just a few uh, a bit of commentary. Uh, I think that there is. Uh, there, there certainly seems to be the perception that a majority of the calls uh, the police services respond to are from the downtown area. So locating it in an area near where a majority of the calls are, I think um, it would make some sense. And, and just secondly, from a location perspective, I, I think that identifying the downtown as the location, if there is to be a future build is something that needs to happen um, 
early on in the process so that so that there is not scouting of, of locations outside of the downtown parameters so uh in the you know I, I i do agree that a building assessment on the existing building should be done first but uh, if ultimately the the decision is to uh, proceed with a new build or to even investigate a new build uh the step one should be a direction that that any new build uh, be in the downtown area uh for a number of reasons for downtown safety and and i think it, it uh you know offers the opportunity to revitalize an area of the downtown so uh, though that, that's my only comment on that aspect of this report, but I do have a question for Mr. Mayor a bit more uh, directly related to this report, unless you had anything to add to that, Mr. Mayor. No, I agree with Councilor Schumacher. So just, I said what I had to on that. I agree with you. You can uh, ask Mr. Vera whatever you'd like. Oh, sorry, Councilor Bezuel, did you want to add something? I just wanted to um, let Councilor Schumacher know that the board has met with CAO White to discuss um, what the process would be. And right now it's at internal um, consultation and there has been a, um, a staff person designated to doing some fact finding and um, surveying with the service right now. Um, to also reiterate, um, the jump station is very active. That's where everyone works out of, especially the people that are on bikes and our community mobilization team who have been key parts of this whole downtown safety strategy. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Bayer. Uh, Councillor Hollingsworth was asking with respect to cameras, uh, but is there, uh, could we put out, uh, I don't know if an RF uh, queue is, is what we're looking to put out, but something of that nature to get a sense of what the cost of security cameras in the downtown would be if we decided to proceed with them? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, uh, we have done some initial ballpark uh, research looking into the cost of security cameras and, and monitored solutions. And uh, we're also in the process of working with some of the downtown business owners that have security solutions in place now uh, to get a better sense of the cost. So I think on that front, when we come back to council, we should be able to uh, be we should be able to provide to council a, a pretty good guesstimate on what costs of the cameras will be and services around those because some of them are monitored, some are not, and then also uh, look at uh, the BIA did send out a survey to its members to ask how many members currently have video camera solutions, um, and so we're gathering information that we should be able to bring back to council. Okay, I, I think that uh, a step, uh, an, an additional step that would probably be worth uh, exploring is asking the companies in town that provide services like this. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know an extensive list of them, but folks like Wireless Com or DC Communications or, or Norpro, just asking them to kind of ballpark uh, uh, some costs for those things would I think be helpful in, in having that information before council. Agreed. Yeah, we will have that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is that it for your questions, Councilor Shoemaker? I have Councilor uh, Nero next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A question for Mr. Vera. Uh, Mr. Vera, based on the description of the Ambassador Pilot Program, I take it that the program coincides with downtown business hours? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Nero, uh, that's correct. We were looking at the program uh, coinciding when businesses were open. Uh, and also we're, we're gathering information to look at are there, you know, certain times of the day or the week um, that issues maybe are more frequent and make sure that we have uh, staff available at those times. Yeah, okay. And uh, it certainly makes sense to, to do it that way. I was just thinking that the Ambassador Pilot Program is looking to, to uh, coincide with business hours, and then the security patrols and surveillance takes over at 11 p.m. And there's, there's a time slot there that uh, the evening uh, where once we, once we open up again, there's patios downtown and there, we would hope that, you know, downtown comes back the way it was pre-pandemic. And there's that time that we don't have anybody down there. If, is anything taken into consideration to cover that time? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Nero. Uh, yes, that was 
Uh, part of the discussion was related to the, uh, the volunteer side of the program. Some of the programs that we have looked at from other communities did have volunteers that uh, were part of the downtown ambassador program. And um, so those volunteers may be able to make up some of the evening hours um, in, the, uh, in the ambassador program um, patrols. Okay, so, so it's being considered, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Dufour. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Ver, uh, Tom, I know we had done uh, some partnership with uh, PUC previously to provide uh, extra street lighting in areas of downtown that were poorly lit. Is that something that um, we can look at continuing as part of our downtown safety strategy? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dufour, uh, yes, I believe that um, this is something we will look at. Uh, we're also looking at doing the uh, streetscape design for Queen Street. Uh, this year. And so, uh, you know, that gives us an opportunity to relook at the uh, street lighting downtown um, with a lens of the uh, crime prevention through environmental design principles and uh, make sure that we address any gaps that we may have. Excellent. And is there, um, who, is there an opportunity for business owners who maybe perhaps have a specific area of concern in terms of lighting? Um, is there someone they can reach out to? Should they go through the DTA or um, who, what's the best um, course of action for someone who's interested in that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dufour, I would suggest, I know the DTA has been coordinating uh, discussions with the police about the uh, SEPTED reviews. And so I would suggest, yes, reach out to the DTA and they can uh, kind of gather those, uh, any uh, issues or concerns from the business owners. And uh, then we can look at solutions. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, I don't have another question, Mr. Mayor, just a comment. Uh, I do see that um, Bill C-75 and the issues with catch and release have been flagged in this uh, report. And I think it's really important for the community to understand that um, you know all of these initiatives that the city has, the legislative and the financial authority to undertake, um, they're, they're relatively low acuity initiatives that are, are you know, kind of aimed at the stuff that, that we are able to, to handle as a municipality. But for, for a lot of the serious issues that, that I'm hearing about um, and that I'm seeing as, uh, as a person who is downtown, um, we really need to see some kind of change or movement uh, in, in terms of the kind of people who are being released into our downtown and into our community. And uh, I hope folks watching know that uh, that point's not lost on this council. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Dufour. So, Council, uh, that uh, we've gone through the list on 610. So, that would bring uh, me to the end of your matters, Council Vezuela. Is that correct? 6.20. Okay, go ahead. And just more, it's a comment, not a question. Um, so, 6.20 is the municipal autism strategy. And I wanted to thank uh, Don McConnell and Nancy Scott for all their work. Um, Don also uh, had Jonathan do a sensory space for design um, that was part of the strategy. And I think it's important for us as a municipality to really understand that we are trailblazers. The federal government still does not have a federal um, strategy. It's being undertaken by the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Um, and it's more of a policy um, doc that they're looking at doing. So um, I just really wanted to um, reach out to both Nancy and Don and everyone that all, all the stakeholders that came together and put time in. Um, I think it was a very um, important exercise for, in terms of all of the collaborative agencies. And it's really timely right now, especially for that birth to 16 um, age cohort because there are a lot of changes happening to the Ontario Autism Program. There's going to be an independent intake organization that will be running the program and it's all gonna be self-funded and directed. So for um, caregivers and families, I think it's really important that we've got this inventory list um, because there's going to be a lot of different changes that's gonna really affect a lot of families. So um, I don't know, Don, if you wanted to add something uh, Mr. Mayor, no, I have nothing further to add to that. And then my only question would be, um, when are we able to go live with these documents on our city website? 
for you, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, that will be almost immediately. All of these documents are already in an accessible format. So we were waiting for uh, council to receive these reports tonight and they'll go up in the next, well, very, very shortly. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Don. Lisa, before we move on, Council Guardian, do you want to speak to 6.20? Uh, I, I think I know what you were going to do, Mr. Mayor, so go right ahead. Before we move on from 6.20, uh, Councilor Bezuan, I want to thank you for your leadership on that and your work on that. Uh, we are where we are because of uh, your initiative, and I want to recognize staff's work, but I want to recognize you uh, putting this in motion. Is that what you were going to do, Councilor Gardy? Yeah, essentially, and for someone who, who interfaces with, with families, with uh, children uh, with developmental needs and autism, uh, those roadmaps are going to be key, like Lisa said. So yeah, I was going to just say thanks, Lisa, Lisa, for your leadership. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Um, so anybody else in 620? Seeing none, Councillor Bezoal, that was the extent of your matters. I'm at Councillor Shoemaker next. All my questions have been asked, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Gardy, you're next. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. That was great. We don't hear that very often. Good. Um, Six, uh, six eleven, Mr. Mayor, uh, the Canada Water Agency. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I just think it presents a really uh, great opportunity for us, Mr. Mayor, over the next couple of decades. I believe that there will be uh, many opportunities through both the private and the public sector to, to study, research, uh, mitigate and overcome some of the, the environmental challenges we face as a result of climate, the climate crisis. And I think in light of our surroundings, I consider Sault Ste. Marie to be uh, very well positioned to take advantage of these opportunities. I personally qualify our community as a city in the midst of a of a natural laboratory. Um, I think the pursuit of this agency, um, working closely with community and regional partners is an important step to further establishing and capitalizing on these opportunities that uh, may, may that uh, climate change presents. Um, we're uniquely positioned to study the impacts of climate change on uh, the Great Lakes, along with the impacts on the rivers and their tributary, tributaries that uh, lead to the Great Lakes. We're surrounded by hundreds of inland bodies of water and we're fortunate to have Indigenous partners who are supportive of the initiative. Um, indigenous people and communities from across the country will uh, be key partners uh, as far as I'm able to discern in this agency, which is, which is uh, important. And uh, the PUC provides and manages water services to a significant portion of this province. We have research facilities already in existence in and around our community that study the different aspects and challenges in the Great Lakes. And, uh, we're home to two post-secondary institutions that both have uh, schools of the environment. Um, and we're geographically well positioned to tackle issues around shared international waters. There aren't many uh, mandates that this water agency has proposed to tackle that uh, we don't address head on here locally. Um, so it's for these reasons that I uh, believe we should establish the task force as outlined. And I'm uh, pretty, pretty hopeful that uh, council is gonna support this and I, uh, I, uh, I thank them for that uh, in advance. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so we do have Kathleen with us tonight too. So staff, if a counselor staff, counsel, if you have any questions, Kathleen was the author of the report. You're welcome to ask her. Uh, anybody else have any comments on the report or that matter? Before we move on from that matter, uh, Councilor Gardy, I wanna just uh, thank Kathleen for the report and her work on this. Uh, it's been uh, nice to work with both you and Councilor Gardy on it. Uh, same same comments to uh, Councillor Bezalon, to, to you, Councillor Gardy. Thank you for your leadership on this and your initiative on this. I, I agree with everything you said. I think we're a natural place to uh, to uh, participate in this, and and I'm sure that we will make that case effectively. And uh, I uh, I look forward to assisting everybody with that work. So, do you have anything else, uh, Councillor Gardy, or is that the extent of your matters? Uh, no, I had one other matter, but it was addressed already, and the question was asked. Thanks. Councillor Hollingsworth, I have you on my list. Are all your matters are addressed, or do you have any additional ones? That's all. Um, just that one item, so I'm good. Thank you. Anybody else with matters on consent? Councillor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 6.6, uh, .6, the Avanti, Avanti payroll and benefits cloud migration. 
I just have a question, and I suppose this would be for Ms. Marlowe, if she's on the call. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, it says in the report that they're going to be, because we're a longstanding customer, giving us a, a discount on a, our five-year subscription. So uh, I'm assuming the way it's laid out is we would get first two years, $5 per employee per month, third year, six, fourth year, six, fifth year, seventh. After that seventh, is it safe to assume that they're going to go back up to the 14 that they usually charge? Mr. Uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Shelly Shell's on the line and uh, can I answer that? Okay. To you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor. Um, we can't really assume anything at this point. Uh, Frank Contramiglio is available. He's the one that negotiated the contract uh, through IT, and he may be able to provide some additional insight into that. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Scott. Um, the assumption would be that we would go back to the market value rates and assuming that they stay at $14, that would be the case. But as our CFO uh, mentioned that, um, that is something that we would be facing five years from now. So the report uses a thousand. Do we have a thousand employees? Is that what we would have? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Scott, it's uh, we based a thousand on uh, on an average uh, uh, per employee. Uh, in some cases, we exceed that. In some cases, we are below that number. Uh, but working with our manager of uh, accounting. Uh, we averaged out a thousand dollars for cost perspective. And historically, how frequently were we paying for upgrades to the software before it went to a software as a service? We, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Scott, the um, updates were done on an annual basis, sometimes two or three times a year. Um, uh, there was tax uh, implications. Um, uh, that we had to upgrade, and any any upgrades that the software um, had to do, uh, we would do throughout the year. And because it wasn't software as a service, that was all in-house upgrading, right? Like it, that would be up to you and your staff. Right, Councillor Scott, that is correct. It was done by our staff. Do you have, and this is going to be a tough question. Do you have a rough estimate on how many man hours that would have taken you and your staff? Do you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Scott, I wouldn't have an estimate on the man hours on that. I, I figured that's kind of a I thought of that after I should have sent that to you ahead of time. Um, and, and in those couple of times a year, like how much were we spending annually on this software? For you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Scott, uh, the annual we budgeted for uh, 40,000 was our sort of annual maintenance and subscription. Um, and that covered uh, software upgrades, any maintenance, uh, any support calls or anything like that. That would okay. be rolled into new pricing uh, per employee per month. Okay, so so even at the five dollars, we're we're looking at a little bit more. But if it goes to fourteen at the end of five years, we're looking at nearly one hundred and seventy thousand dollars per year, uh, based on the per employee per month, and and that's quite a significant increase over what we're paying now. I understand most things are moving to cloud based and software and uh, as a service and all that. It's just I get a little bit freaked out with that stuff because it. it seems attractive at first, but the costs really do add up. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to get some questions out there about this. Uh, for the next five years, it's not looking too bad, but in, in five years, I think that this might be something we want to look at uh, definitely again, um, simply because that cost is, if, if we go to the 14 uh, per employee per month, that's, that's quite a significant chunk of money. So thank you. Those are all my questions on that item. Hey, thank you. Anybody else on that item? Councillor Scott, do you have any other items? Uh, not that I think of, I can see. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Council, any other matters on consent? That seems to be it, Madam Clerk. I have a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Scott resolves that all the items listed under date June 28, 2021, agenda item six, consent agenda be approved as recommended. All in favor? Motion carried. That will take us to agenda item 
7.2.1. Um, the municipal election 2022. I've got, I'll read the main motion and there is also uh, an amendment that's been proposed. Uh, the main motion moved by Councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy resolved that the report of the City Clerk and Deputy City Clerk dated June 28, 2021 concerning Municipal Election 2022 be received and that the 2022 Municipal Election be conducted with in-person voting and tabulator count at an estimated cost of $320,000. Further, that staff be authorized to issue an RFP for the acquisition of the vote tabulators. The amendment proposed by Councillors Shoemaker and Hilsinger, be it further resolved that count, to add the words, be it further resolved that Council direct staff to include a register to vote by mail option for the 2022 election and that the additional cost associated with the register to vote by mail process be paid from a source determined to be most appropriate by staff or in the event a source cannot be identified from the unforeseen reserve. Okay, Council, so let's start with the amendment then. So that was like, we'll, we'll start there because if that is defeated, it, if, it's, if, it's, if it's passed, that's your motion. If it's defeated, it, it goes back to the main motion. So, so Council Shoemaker moved that, Council uh, Hilsinger seconded it. So do we have any, uh, let's start with our discussion on that. Councillor Shoemaker, did you want to speak to the amendment? Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor uh, Hilsinger and I, brought a uh, resolution early in the term seeking to increase turnout um, in the next election. And uh, I think the report uh, identifies efficiencies in the next uh, electoral counting process and recommends vote tabulators, uh, uh, which should uh, both speed up the uh, results being known and, uh, you know, pr prove some, provide some efficiencies in terms of accuracy spoiled ballots, things of that nature. Uh, I don't think it goes quite as far as uh, offering alternatives that uh, would increase turnout or provide greater enfranchisement to folks who, uh, who might have some hesitation uh, attending polling stations next year if there is still any concern as to congregating in large areas. I, I do hope we're past that, but of course we won't know until we are past it uh, in next fall. Um, so I, I think that uh, adding in a register to vote by mail option is something of a hybrid where we aren't providing vote by mail to everybody uh, who's registered on the voters list, but anybody who wants to vote by mail will have the option to do so. And I, in my discussions with the city clerk and the deputy city clerk, I think the, um, the numbers are somewhere between five and 10% of people uh, who are eligible voters uh, have taken up uh, opportunities to do this in other municipalities that have been uh, that have been researched. So I, I do think that that is one way that we can fulfill um, uh, 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 an effort to increase uh, voter participation by providing greater access to um, to various methods of voting. I mean, we've got vote at home, that's great. We've got advanced polls, that's great. Uh, I think this is another aspect uh, to be able to increase voter turnout. And secondly, uh, it is to prepare us in case we aren't past the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issue of, of surges in, in the pandemic and things of that nature. I, I think what nobody wants to see is um, uh, what happened in Newfoundland in the, in the spring or in, in the winter. I can't remember when their election was, but um, they were scheduled to vote in person and there were significant COVID outbreaks and it required in the middle of a, a campaign for uh, the whole thing to be shifted to a vote by mail system. So uh, both for good preparation and to, um, to uh, attempt to enfranchise more people, I think that uh, adding a register to vote by mail option makes some sense uh, and that uh, it, it'll hopefully uh, have some success and be taken up uh, on, uh, some people will take, a, take us up on the opportunity to, to exercise their franchise this way. Councillor Hilsinger, you wanna add anything to that? Uh, Councillor Shoemaker uh, summarized uh, what we were thinking and hence the reason for this, uh, for this motion. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Bruni, then Councillor Hollingsworth and Councillor Nero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess a question <clears throat> to the city clerk. How would this uh, mail-in voting 
procedure um, work? With respect to a register to vote by mail, is that the yes. question? Yes, yes. Yes. So, um, uh, as uh, Councillor Shoemaker said, rather than mailing a, a package to every single eligible voter, people who are interested in voting by mail, who um, for whatever reason may not want to go to a physical voting location, they register with the clerk's office requesting that that vote by mail package be sent to them. So we send them the package with secrecy envelopes and declaration cards. They complete that and mail it back to us. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, we wouldn't know what the additional cost would be for this. An approximate, if Mr. Shoemaker, uh, Councillor Shoemaker said five to 10% in Pretty the area. Councillor Bruni, um, it's estimated communities who do uh, offer the vote, uh, register to vote by mail option have generally estimated 10% of their eligible voters taking advantage of that program. And the average appears to be uh, five to 7% of uh, eligible voters who actually do. But you want to order sufficient that you could cover the individuals who are asking for it. And uh, in our report, when we were calculating costs, um, based on the assumption that 10% of eligible voters or 5,500 would register, the additional cost would be approximately $45,000. Okay. Um, so when would the cutoff date be for someone to uh, be asked for uh, to register by mail? How would that process uh, take effect? Like, is there like a one week cutoff period or? There would have to be a cutoff for when they would request to vote by mail just for the uh, processing time to uh, send it out and bring it back. Of course, people can, um, and we experienced this when we administered the vote by mail um, election for the territories without uh, municipal organization in Algoma. Some people like to bring it to uh, City Hall so they can actually put it uh, in a box. So that there's that option as well as mailing it back. Okay, I thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor Bernie. Um, then I have Councilor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Um, through you, Your Worship. Um, May I make a suggestion to the mover, Councillor um, Shoemaker? He and I were briefly speaking about um, whatever is decided tonight. Can we also include that a thorough testing of the new process with a mock election is done with a minimum of 100 volunteers prior to it going to live? For example, the reason I bring this up is that many, many times we have seen over the last year, a couple of years, other municipalities have tried something similar and they go live and there's bugs and there's problems and it's a disaster. I would really like to see somewhere in this resolution that we have a mock election of at least with a hundred individuals to work out any kinks or any potential kinks. Um, that's, I feel very important. It just basically um, make sure the whole process works before it goes live in such a critical, um, you know, election time. So that that's an amendment. That's a, some, a substantial amendment to the main motion. So I think that would have to be dealt with independent of the amendment Councillor Shoemaker and Councillor Filsinger have moved. I think we have to deal with their amendment. It worked through that. And if you want to move that amendment, you'd have to have a seconder for it. We'd have to work through that because it it's a substantial uh, addition to the motion. So I, I wouldn't consider that an amendment of their amendment. I would consider it essentially a, a new amendment of the main motion. Mr. Mayor, if I could make a comment, it might um, be helpful. I would just suggest that because we do have the experience of running vote by mail um, in the territories without municipal organization, we've got some uh, level of comfort with administering a vote by mail and particularly when it's a register to vote by mail that you, you don't have 55,000 um, potential ballots coming to you. Um, I would suggest if you were considering something online, absolutely 
a uh, a mock would would be worthwhile. Um, I'm I'm not convinced, uh, with all due respect, that the uh, work involved to create the mock, um, if it if it would be necessary given our previous experience. Okay, so let's stay on the, the amended motion. So I have Councillor uh, Nero next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to the City Clerk, Ms. Tizinski, um, be, uh, and I think in the report, it mentions something about advanced poll voting. And it, when it goes towards increasing voter turnout, if we were looking at increasing the amounts of, of advanced poll voting, would we have to do something in adding it to the motion tonight, or is that something could be looked at at the time if necessary? Do you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Nero, that is not something that we would uh, need to consider tonight. That would be the sort of thing that we would consider as we proceed through administering the uh, election process. And bylaws are required for advanced vote days. So if we were going to consider other locations or additional days, uh, that discussion could happen at that time. So when that time comes, we could look at the advanced polls as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Anybody else uh, have any uh, comments, questions on this report? Or sorry, on the amendment? None. So can we have a vote on the amendment? All in favor of the amendment? Any opposed to the amendment? So the main motion, uh, so, so uh, Councilor Bruni was opposed to the amendment, everybody else was in favor. So the motion is now amended. So now we're on the main motion as amended. Do we have any discussion and comments or questions on the main motion? Councilor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to thank uh, the city clerk and the deputy city clerk for the work that they put into this. Uh, I, uh, I attended the open house uh, virtually when it was, when it was held. Uh, I got disconnected at some point, but uh, but I was there for about 95% of it, and uh, it was uh, well laid out. I think it 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 uh, it resulted in a good report, and uh, happy with uh, happy with the path forward that is being recommended here today. Okay. Any other comments on this matter? Thank you to both the clerk and the deputy clerk for their work on this. Councilor Bruni, you you have something you want to add on the main motion? You're on mute still, Councilor Bruni. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Are, are we talking about the tabulators yet? Yeah, that's what we're on now. Okay. Uh, just a question to the city clerk. There's no funding available from, from the government uh, because they do provide the city X amount of dollars for elections. Am I correct? Are you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruni? No, I'm afraid not. No? No, we, uh, we fund election through the um, annual contributions to the election reserve from the um, general levy. Thank you. Any other questions of staff on this or comments? So we have the main motion as amended. All in favor? Motion carried. <coughs> Uh, to agenda item 7.3.1, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Gardy, resolved that the report of the Director of Tourism and Community Development dated June 28, 2021, be received, and further that Council approve the adoption of the Sault Ste. Marie Community Safety Wellbeing Plan. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Anderson, are, are you uh, just here? To, you're just here to answer questions, or are you uh, were you doing a presentation? Just here to uh, answer questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation to the Police Service Board. I wasn't sure if you were going to take a similar presentation. Uh, the Police Service Board, uh, after you left the meeting, did pass a resolution endorsing uh, the Community Safety Plan. Uh, Council, uh, do we have any questions for Mr. Uh, Anderson on this plan? I'd like to thank uh, Travis, uh, you and the team 
here at the city for developing the plan. And, and I want to recognize and thank police services for working with you on that. Special uh, thanks to Lauren Dockstader, who uh, was with us and did a lion's share of this work uh, before she left for a different position. Uh, and I do want to just uh, uh, remark that uh, a lot of work is happening in our community to address some of the challenges in our community. And one of the things that we don't lack is a high, uh, a high effort and rate of collaboration across our community. There's lots of people working together. Uh, the Oboma leadership team is, is being relied upon heavily to create that collaboration and to make sure that we're all aligned and, and working together. And I think this report is, is evidence that we, we see our challenges, we acknowledge them, we're working together on them, and we're trying to do our best to address them within our legislative jurisdiction and our means. So I want to thank you for that work. I want to thank you for bringing it to us tonight, and, uh, and uh, I appreciate it. So I'm going to go to Councillor Dufour, who has his hand up here. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Sorry I didn't get in uh, for the questions there. I don't have a question, just more of a comment. Uh, ha having gone through the report, and, and again, I, I certainly agree with your assessment on the quality of uh, Mr. Anderson's work. Um, it, it was very notable to myself that of all the action items, I believe only one of them is uh, directly uh, applicable to the City of Sault Ste. Marie corporate proper. Um, and that one is building standards. All the others are, uh, are action items that are the, uh, the responsibility or the purview of various other community partners and agencies who are obviously very important. Um, and uh, I, I think it's uh, significant there um, just with uh, how much provincial and federal collaboration that we need to properly fund those community agencies to undertake uh, many of those action items contained within this plan. Um, as you said, we can only do what's in our legislative authority to do. And in terms of this plan, that, that seems to just be building standards. Thanks. Anything else for Mr. Anderson? Okay, Madam Clerk, that would bring us to, uh, um, we have a vote on this. Yeah. Dr. Dufour? Waiting for Councillor Scott. Oh, Councillor Shoemaker and Councillor Hollingsworth. Okay, so show of hands, all in favor? So it's been approved. I don't see Councilor Shoemaker, but everybody else has voted in favor. So you could adjust your back. That will bring us to agenda item 8.1. I have a motion by Councilors Hilsinger and Scott, whereas the province of Ontario has vaccinated over 64% of residents 18 and over with their first dose and over 17% with their second dose. And whereas over 75% of Algoma's population over the age of 18 has received at least their first vaccination and over 18% have received their second. And whereas COVID-19 cases in the Algoma region are at 0 0.9 per 100,000. And whereas the province of Ontario has entered step one of the reopening plan on June 11, 2021, ahead of schedule due to strong provincial vaccination numbers, reduced ICU cases and reduced COVID-19 infections. And whereas personal service businesses such as hair salons and nail salons and tattoo shops have implemented strict COVID-19 safety precautions as part of the province's previous reopening plan to ensure the safety of their staff and customers. And whereas personal businesses have most recently been closed since April 3, 2021 and owners and staff have suffered greatly through the pandemic. Now therefore be it resolved that Sault Ste. Marie City Council Request that the province of Ontario consider allowing personal service businesses and gyms to a maximum of 10 people or as deemed appropriate to reopen as soon as possible as part of step one with strict limited capacities. Okay, so uh, we're going to go to you first on that, Councillor Hillsinger. Your uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so we know that, um, you know, you, you mentioned this uh, at the beginning of, of our meeting that uh, we're certainly doing well here in, in our region. Uh, certainly the province of Ontario uh, additionally is doing much better in terms of um, uh, its uh, positive tests and, and, and so on. Um, I'm very happy to say that on Wednesday afternoon, I get my second shot. Yay. Very happy to do that. 
Uh, and, um, you know, uh, this, this uh, concern was brought forward by someone in the personal services uh, industry, a, a hair salon owner. And, and you know, is, while the province has moved ahead um, to allow um, uh, personal services uh, only, not gyms, uh, to open on uh, July, June 30th, um, a little bit ahead of schedule, um, these businesses are extremely challenged, um, both the business owners and uh, the folks who work for them. Um, and there are certainly other businesses that are uh, really struggling right now because the, the you know, serious and major restrictions are still in place. So um, I was very happy to support this and thank you to Councillor Scott uh, for doing so as well. Um, and just demonstrating that as soon, as soon, as soon as it is safely possible to do so, our businesses in Ontario Ontario want to be reopened uh, to the fullest capacity possible. And uh, I certainly I would appreciate the support of our council um, in, in making that uh, very clear as a statement from our city. Okay, would we, uh, Councillor Scott, did you want to add to that? Uh, sure, Mr. Mayor, uh, just a little bit. I don't know if I'm being choppy. My internet's been a little bit weird right now. Uh, I just wanted okay. to more or less repeat everything that Councillor Hillsinger said. Uh, I was big on the idea of, you know, the, the personal care uh, prior to that opening up. Uh, I look around the rest of council and not all of council here shares my need for a haircut, I see, but uh, it is something that, uh, <laughs> that I've been needing for some time and, and I know that they've been impacted quite a bit. So I, I'm happy to, to see that that got opened up, but that doesn't exclude the other other areas that we know are hurting and, and our province is doing great. Our city's doing great. Uh, we get recognized in other parts of Ontario. I've even been reading uh, some places online mentioning how good Algoma has been doing. And I think that that's a real boon for our community. And that, that really shows uh, the, the kind of work we can do as a community when it comes to public health. So uh, yeah, hopefully we can get the support of this and uh, I was happy to second it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Scott. Council, do we have any questions or comments on the resolution? Councillor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to Councillor Scott, I too need a haircut. I, I have one on the top of my head. I think it's about two inches long the last time I looked. So uh, I'll be looking forward to getting that trimmed. Uh, I, I just wanted to, I, I definitely support the resolution and, and Councillor Hilsinger touched on it. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and you uh, mentioned it in the past, Mr. Mayor, uh, Ontario Public Health recognizes Sault Ste. Marie as prob and the Algoma District is probably the one area in, in Ontario that's done the best and has coped the best with this, this pandemic. So uh, in support of this resolution and, and, and the, uh, the message behind it, I think we as a community need to celebrate our achievement here. We often don't take time to recognize our achievements and this is an opportunity to do so. And I think it's a perfect time uh, to promote our success in pushing this resolution through. Thank you. Councilor Gardy. I don't have much to say about <clears throat> haircuts, um, but I will follow on the theme of, of public health and doing well. Um, you know, um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Um, our community being able to, to, to manage through the pandemic speaks to a level of sophistication that uh, we should be proud of. Um, and it, it isn't by accident. Um, you know what, Mr. Mayor, um, I will say that, uh, you know, Ms. Councillor Scott mentioned, um, you know, other parts of the province recognizing our community for doing well. Um, you know, I know that you've been recognized by uh, some people in the province for, for your leadership. And, um, you know, our community, worked hand in hand with Algoma Public Health. And we amplified their message and they did the same for us. And um, it was it, this wasn't by accident, it, it was by design. It was being proactive. It was uh, speaking with one voice and communicating clearly and uh, concisely, which uh, not all the other parts of the world did. And uh, so we should all uh, be proud of that. And, you know, back to the hair thing for a second, just as, as uh, we encouraged everybody to to get as much takeout as we could over the pandemic and to support restaurants as they reopen, um, you know, support these businesses as much as you can stay looking sharp. If you can afford it this summer and uh, get an extra haircut or two over the course of the next several months. Thank you. Any other comments on this resolution? So before we pass it, I just want to thank the mover and the seconder for it. Uh, I, uh, 
I support it. You know, I was, uh, you know, I would have been supportive of the province continuing on their regional kind of uh, implementation efforts that they had prior to uh, the last emergency order, uh, but, but it went in a different direction and, and I understand why. Uh, in any event, I want to recognize that there are a lot of businesses in our community that have been struggling, uh, specifically the personal services businesses. I want to recognize their effort and, and, and uh, the challenge that they're facing. And I want to remain hopeful that we are nearing the end of this. But I also want to reiterate the message that we need to continue to respect, uh, listen to and follow public health advice so we can continue uh, to have the good uh, numbers that we currently have in our community and hopefully have these businesses opened for good and hopefully see these businesses uh, come back to a place where they're thriving. So uh, I appreciate uh, the leadership of council to speak out on this issue and uh, I'm going to support the resolution. And I wanna thank the community again for the effort that they've made to get us to where we are. And I wanna just reiterate that we need to keep on making this effort to keep ourselves safe and our families safe and each other safe as a community at large. All in favor? Motion is carried. Agenda item 8.2, West End Splash Pad. The motion by Councillors Gardy and Bruni, whereas in June 2019, the City of Sault Ste. Marie opened its first splash pad in Bellevue Park in the east end of the community. And whereas since its opening, the splash pad has been heavily used and thoroughly enjoyed by children and families. And whereas the City of Sault Ste. Marie should aim to provide equitable access to amenities and services in different parts of the community, especially as they relate to families and children. And whereas as a community, we have been working to revitalize our city parks. And whereas there are many parks in the western part of Sault Ste. Marie that could be revitalized. And whereas many communities of our size have more than one splash pad. Now, therefore, be it resolved that city staff be requested to explore opportunities and locations for the establishment of a second splash pad in a city park in the west end of Sault Ste. Marie and report back to city council with a list of potential sites for the establishment of a splash pad in the Sioux's west end. Okay, so Councilor Guardian, I'm going to let you go first on this. And then uh, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the motion mentions that the splash pad of Bellevue Park has been a hit. It's very well used and uh, though it's enjoyed by people across the community, I'm of the opinion that a city our size should have more than one of these pads. Um, I believe that a park in the west end of our community should be the place where the city, is, city establishes um, a second. Um, there are many parks in the west end. And I'm not sh entirely sure which uh, which one would be best suited. Um, that said, you know, as I think of things and look around the city in the western part of the city, one does come to mind. Um, as I pass by Lennox Park uh, every day, um, the, the 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 park just west of the railway crossing at the bottom of Second Line Hill, I think is a potential contender um, based upon what I think we need uh, to, to to house one of these parks. In my mind, due to its size, being able to accommodate a splash pad, and uh, but I also think its location lends itself um, to being highly visible from a busy thoroughfare that I think would mitigate any issues involving uh, potential vandalism. But that's just the thought. Anyway, I hope uh, my fellow councillors are supportive of this first step to establishing a splash pad in a park in the West End, and I'm uh, really thankful for Councillor Bruni being the first. Thanks, Councillor Bruni. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I thank uh, 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 Councillor Gardy to bring this forward. Um, I think there is a need uh, for a splash pack park uh, in the West End. Um, Councillor Gardy mentioned Lennox Park. I also mentioned Elliott Park uh, is another location, but uh, we're just asking staff to come back with a report. So uh, we're, we're going to look forward for the report to come forward. Thank you. So I have a couple other councillors that have put up their hands to speak to this. So we will go with Councillor Shoemaker, then Councillor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks to uh, Councillor Gardy and Councillor Bruni for bringing this forward. Through you to Mr. Lamming, uh, or Mr. Vare, in the uh, Parks Master Plan, is there a uh, indication that there would be a West End signature park anywhere in town, anywhere in the West End? 
through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Shoemaker, the signature park in the West End is Elliott Park. Uh, through that master plan that was brought on May 20, uh, 25th, 2020, it uh, really indicated to look at reinvigorating, revitalizing three parks per year. And that's what we bring forward to council every year to, uh, to budget time to deliberate upon. Yeah, okay, thanks. I, I, I do think that, uh, I mean, Councilor Gardy makes note of Lennox, Lennox Park and Councilor Bruni of Elliott, uh, James Elliott uh, Park. So. Uh, personally, I mean, we, you could ask all 11 of us, we might all have different opinions, but James Elliott Park, I think, makes the most sense. It's got pickleball courts, it's got soccer fields, baseball diamonds, uh, it's got uh, walking trails in the winter. I think complementing that with a splash pad would just amp up the usage, and I do think it's in a great uh, centralized residential location to the south, east, and west of, well, the, the south and west for sure of there uh, to draw uh, lots of community uh, uh, use from. So that would be my opinion, but I look forward to uh, seeing what comes back on us. Councilor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, congratulations to Councilor Gardy and, and uh, Councilor Bruni for bringing this forward. I support it 100%. I was lucky enough to work on the original splash pad plan. Um, and, and I agree, there's definitely a need. I think the city though is evolving and I think we all recognize it and people could argue, but I think there's pretty much four distinct areas in the city now. We've got East, West, Central and North. Um, I, I hope we can get to a point and I'll take some responsibility for this because I was involved in the first splash pad development that we can get to a point where instead of just looking at one splash pad, that it, as part of the initial process, we recognize that there's a need throughout the community. And so that counselors, you know, don't have to bring forward a resolution asking for a splash pad to be considered in their end of town. Um, this issue has come up a couple of times with constituents and I had another one mention it. Um, you know, we probably should be taking a more holistic approach. I, I completely agree with this resolution. I take part of the responsibility that has to come forward because, as I say, I think perhaps we could have at least identified the need in the West End so that it would just simply be a matter of budgeting it in when the time came. Um, the fact is we represent all, uh, all constituents in the community. Um, so, you know, when we pass these things, when we consider them, I think we should be taking a more holistic approach. I don't want to take anything away from the resolution. I'm taking some responsibility here. Uh, we should have had this thought out earlier, but I congratulate both Councillor Gardy and Bruni for bringing it forward now. Okay, uh, Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Um... I think it's a wonderful idea, of course. I just want to confirm, I'm under the impression that it may be somewhat similar design to the one in the East, meaning that um, sensory um, for our, our children that you know, may be autistic. Um, I guess that's my first question. Main question is how similar will it be um, to the one in um, the East end, especially around the sensory aspect? If that's if it might be too early yeah. to ask the question. Yeah, I, I think it is. The the the, the report the, the motion doesn't doesn't uh, direct that. I think it's it's asking staff to look at it. I think that would be that would be part of staff's assessment and recommendation to us when they come back was like what where they think it should be located and what they think it should look like. So I think it would be once they're back to us on the full report, I think that would be the time to have these discussions. Okay, and I know they would take in consideration the sensory aspect for the autism. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on this initiative? Uh, so I just want to indicate I completely support it. I, I frankly think we should do it. Uh, I, I look forward to staff's report. I drive by the, the splash pad in Bellevue Park uh, every day, at least twice a day. And I'm always uh, happy uh, with how busy it is. And every time I drive by it, I think it was money that was very well spent. And that's returning uh, to the community through quality of life. There are families there and there are kids there and it's being used actively and there should be one in the other end of our city. Uh, so we can provide the same opportunities to residents who live farther away from Bellevue Park. 
works. I think it's a great idea. It's a great initiative. We should figure out where to put it, and then we should put it there. Because they're not capital intensive builds. Uh, and a matter of equity, fairness, and building the community that is is uh, is creates a quality of life for all of our residents. We should we should just move ahead with the project. So I look forward to staff support, and hopefully we could uh, narrow down where it should go and, and get moving on putting it there. So all in favor? Motion is carried. That will bring us to bylaws. I have a motion by Councillors Hollinsworth and Scott. Results that all bylaws under item 11 of the agenda under date June 28, 2021, save and accept bylaw 2021-136 be approved. All in favor. Just accepted bylaw uh, 2021-136 on account of Councillor Christian's conflict. I will open that to vote. And the, it is a motion by Councillors Hollingsworth and Scott resolved that bylaw 2021-136 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of the agreement between the city and Algoma District School Board for the community partnership project at the former Etienne Brule school site be passed in open council this 28th day of June, 2021. All in favor? Mayor, uh, my voting's not working. Just to let you know, City Clerk. Yeah, m mine's uh, not working great either, Councillor Hollingsworth. So it did uh, freeze briefly. I believe that was unanimous vote. Yeah, it was. Okay. Then I have. We'll proceed to uh, close, having um, adjourned from the four o'clock session. And I have a motion by Councillors Christian and Gardy that this council now adjourn. All in favor. Carried. Thank you, everybody.